Uh, good morning. Uh, so I just wanted to um, highlight really four areas uh, that hopefully will provide a bit of context for the discussion that we're going to have, uh, and also uh, some of the business questions that flow from that. Um, so firstly, to get the slides working. Uh, yeah, so firstly, the Reuters Institute Digital News Report. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, based on a survey of 11,000 people uh, this year in nine countries, and uh, we were aiming to look in detail at what, when, and how people are consuming news. Uh, it's an open resource. You can see it on the web, uh, digitalnewsreport.org. And we're incredibly uh, grateful to uh, our sponsors, uh, some of whom are here, so Google, um, the BBC, Ofcom, and also uh, academic partners uh, as, as well. So just to those four themes then. So. Um, firstly, the pace of change, the speed of transition. So Mark last night talked about uh, the media industry and, the, uh, and its need to innovate uh, both commercially and editorially, uh, the sort of revolution that, that we're in. And uh, you see the image there is, is the one that's often presented uh, and uh, a lot of digital devices, profusion of digital devices, not a, not a newspaper in sight. Uh, may be familiar to many people in, in the room here too. But to what extent is this true more widely? What extent is it true beyond the US and, and the UK? Uh, so some of the data from our report is in fact quite surprising in terms of the differences that we see in different markets, even in fairly similar developed countries where we did our surveys. So in Germany, for example, we see a continuing heavy reliance on traditional media, with 63% of our online survey continuing to read a newspaper at least uh, once a week. Over 80% are watching an appointment to view television program or a linear news channel each week in Germany. Uh, but also really surprising that in our sample, and remember this is an online sample, 34% uh, so they don't use any online news at all. So these are people who are online who are still using effectively uh, traditional sources. In France we see uh, a slightly different picture, so lower levels of newspaper uh, readership. Uh, but again, about a third of the sample of online users still not engaging with online news in a significant way. Uh, and in France, a real commitment to linear television news, and in fact, linear radio as well in terms of consumption. And then in the US, uh, just as a, as, as, a, as a different market, much higher levels of online uh, news usage, uh, so 75%. Uh, and relatively lower levels of newspaper readership. So really significant differences between countries, but also, interestingly, within countries. So this chart compares online news with television news. So these are the two most popular forms of news in terms of access. It's comparing it by age group across all of our countries. So we're aggregating the 11,000 people here. And the question we asked here was not about frequency of access, but what is it that you prefer? What is your main or most important form of news? And what's interesting here is we see a clear platform preference divide. So the younger half of the population, uh, the under 45s, much prefer online media. Older people much prefer television news. And you see uh, a sort of similar picture if you, if you do that for newspapers as well. Having said that, really important, the point Mark made last night, uh, that it's not an either or, of course. This is a preference issue. Uh, so the young and old, we find, are consuming across the media type. So young people are still produce, uh, watching television and reading newspapers. Older people are using digital media. It's just that the preference is for digital for those people who've grown up uh, with digital. So key questions around the pace of change. How do brands reconcile? these very different media habits. So older people who still like that addition, that appointment to view and read, uh, and younger groups who are increasingly accessing news through, throughout the day and are more comfortable with online. So that's a resource question, but it's also a format question. So um, Mark mentioned live blogs. You know, how, how do live blogs, uh, the, the live blogs that the New York Times are doing, fit into that video, longer form journalism? You know, how, how does that mix work? And then secondly, uh, to what extent 
do brands need to produce different strategies for different territories? So that question of you know, international applicability came up again last night. Is it possible to take a brand like The Guardian, The New York Times, The Huffington Post and follow the same strategy in each territory or does it require more tailored approaches? So the second theme uh, is paying for news. So uh, the whole question, uh, as people move online and away from printed newspapers, uh, talked a lot about it again last night. There's a huge amount of data in the report on this. I'm just going to do this in one slide. So we asked our entire sample of 11,000 people if they bought a newspaper in the last week. And half of them, 50%, said they paid for a, a newspaper in the week we did our polling. That's uh, when we asked people wh whether they paid for digital news in the last week, the figure was just 5%. Uh, that's either on a one-off basis or as part of a wider digital subscription. So what's interesting is that's about 2% more than our survey last year, so it's increasing. Um, but in a nutshell, I think that uh, statistic sums up the scale of the problem facing newspapers in particular, particularly as the advertising revenues are suffering, and as again we heard, the lion's share of the online advertising is currently going to the likes of Google and Facebook with the advantages of those enormous volumes that again Mark referred to last night and the data insight uh, that, go, that goes with that. So the key questions are pretty well rehearsed. Uh, can people be persuaded to pay for online news? Um, a really interesting one is, will newspapers become a niche product in the future? Robert Picard, in the report, which you have a copy of, argued very interestingly in his essay that if more newspapers go behind the paywalls, if they're chasing the 5% who are prepared to pay, will newspapers increasingly become a niche product, leaving general news for broadcasters or, or aggregators? It'd be interesting to hear the views of the panel on that. And then finally, uh, you know, what are the alternatives to subscription and advertising? We heard some, uh, some of those uh, laid out uh, for the New York Times last night. Theme three. Theme three is the move to multi-platform, or more specifically, to mobile and tablet. So we've witnessed huge change in the last few years. Uh, our survey shows that just in the last year, Tablet usage for news has pretty much doubled in the countries that we surveyed in 2012. So in the UK, from 8% to 16%, US, 11% to 16% for news. Um, and perhaps even more dramatic is, is the smartphone. Uh, and you can see here that in a number of countries like the UK, the US, Spain, Denmark, uh, a third or more are now using smartphones to access news compared with just a tiny percentage a few years ago. And that obviously coincides with the, the, the figures reported by the New York Times, over 50% coming in for the Boston bombing. Uh, and the, new, the BBC and The Guardian both reported earlier this year that traffic now from mobiles and tablets has overtaken traffic from PCs on a generalised level uh, for the first time this year. More generally, this is a figure we're tracking every year, the overlaps are becoming much greater between devices. So across all of our countries, a third, 33%, are now using at least two digital devices every week to access news, 9%, at least three, and that's significantly up from last year. And this is important because we find that digital devices are encouraging people to consume more news. It's also extending the range of access points. Uh, so the more frequently, uh, more devices people have, the more frequently they access. If you take the US, the average 56% are coming in several times a day for all news users. If you have a smartphone, you're coming in 76%. And if you have uh, all three, smartphone, tablet and computer, it, it goes up to 89%. So some of the key questions around multi-platform. Um, how much does mobile change things? To what extent can you pump out content in a neutral way across all devices, or how much do you need to adapt that content for, for mobile, for tablets? Uh, do you need to produce more snackable short-form news to fit that mobile and social world uh, that at least part of the population is, uh, it says they want? Do you need to more widely, do you need to change the production processes, say, from a newspaper with digital add-ons to, to a genuinely platform neutral approach where you can be flexible about uh, adapting to new platforms. 
And finally, it's obviously not just mobile and tablets. Uh, we've got smartwatches uh, coming along. We've got smart TVs, a whole load of other devices yet to emerge. So how do you decide where to focus your limited resource? Finally, uh, brands and uh, disaggregation. So we were keen to find out what happens to news brands in a world where they are exposed to far greater competition. So new players, aggregators, search engines, and social media. So uh, this is a slightly complicated chart, but I think a really important one. It's derived from a question we ask about what sources people use to access news. And we've divided into three camps. So we've put together the red bars on the left, traditional news brands. That's newspapers and broadcasters into, into one category. And then the blue is aggregators and pure players. So that might be Yahoo or MSN or Huffington Post, Google News. And then on the right is the grey one, so social media and blogs, essentially sort of personal media. And what's interesting is that every country, apart from Japan, where Yahoo has over 60% of the market, traditional news brands in aggregate remain by far the most important source of news, and as Mark was saying, hugely trusted as well, because we asked about trust. In some countries like the United States, if you, if you look at that, uh, pure players and blogs are a much more significant factor than, uh, for example, in the UK or Denmark, where national brands have been much stronger uh, and there's been less inroads from those, those newer players. We can also drill down into any of those countries, and we do in the report, to look at individual brand performance online and offline. So here in the UK, uh, we see a picture of strong traditional brands with the BBC an example of a brand that has leveraged its strengths across online and offline. So over 50% of our sample using it on a weekly basis. Uh, interestingly, the only big mover in the past year in the UK has been the Huffington Post, started about two years ago here, has already overtaken The Sun, one of the UK's biggest best-selling newspaper brands. In the US, by contrast, um, it is uh, the aggregators and the pure players that are at the top of the list. So Huffington Post, almost twice the reach of the New York Times, for example. But it's a much more balanced picture. And some traditional brands, like the New York Times, continuing to deliver very strong audience figures. And then uh, in France, um, a much lower level of online news usage in general, as we saw earlier, but also a much more fragmented picture. So broadcasters haven't been able to do what the BBC has done in the UK, but interestingly, newspapers like, like Le Monde have managed to increase their reach online compared with offline, which is uh, you know, a big achievement, even if the business issues obviously remain a significant problem. So another measure of the strength of brands is the question we asked about how people find news, how do they get to news? And here again, we see significant differences between countries. So in the UK, when people want to know about news, they first think about a brand, then they go to search, and then to social media in terms of the preference of the three. Whereas in France, the primary gateway is search, and the same is true in Germany and Italy and Spain. And this, I think, helps to explain why people in those countries are much more concerned about the, the role of Google and aggregators because it is a far bigger factor in the whole news discovery process than it is in the UK or even in the US. So uh, just finally, the key questions around brand. Uh, so to what extent is it possible to cling on to the idea of a destination brand? So in a world where increasing numbers of people want to pick and mix from multiple sources are coming in through aggregators or social media, to what extent can you really hold the line around people coming to your destination? And uh, that question of how brands should handle those relationships with search en engines, aggregators, social media sites. So clearly they drive a lot of traffic, uh, but do aggregators need to, to pay more, to do more, to help pay for the costs of the journalistic wares that they display? So hopefully uh, you know, a range of interesting data points uh, and some key questions to stimulate discussion and provide uh, context. Thank you very much.